All right, everyone's got that notification. <laughs> All right, well, uh, without further ado, I think um, it looks like the participants have kind of stopped trickling in, so um, we will get started. Um, so let me, sorry about this. I seem to be missing a slide here, a very important slide. Uh, and it in for some reason, there we go. All right, so thank you again uh, for joining us today. Thanks for, for bearing with us through the technical difficulties. Um, it's always important to, to start and um, think about the words of the land acknowledgement um, deeply and um, why are these flicking through now? Um, so yeah, I just, I, I would uh, hope we all can take a minute and really think about these words and, and appreciate them and um, just acknowledge that we are on the traditional territories of the Wendat and the Haudenosaunee and the Anishinaabe peoples, um, at least here on the Oak Ridges Moraine we are, um, whose presence here continues to this day. Um, and we'd also like to acknowledge the land we are on um, is at the meeting place of two treaties, the lands of the Mississaugas of the Credit and those of the First Nations of the Williams Treaty. So we thank them and other Indigenous peoples for sharing this land with us. And we would also like to acknowledge the Chippewas of the Georgina Island First Nation as our closest Indigenous community. We acknowledge this land and the people because the first step to reconciliation is recognizing the existence of Indigenous people. A shared understanding of how our collective past brought us to where we are today will help us walk together into a better future. So we give deep gratitude to the Indigenous peoples of these lands who have been stewards of this land since time immemorial. And the Oak Ridges Moraine Land Trust uh, endeavors to honor the land and its treaties by strengthening our relationship and responsibilities to them. So I know we're all kind of uh, hailing from quite a large geography, but uh, always important to, to take that minute and um, just be grateful for the land that you're on. So, um, the Oak Ridges Marine Land Trust, uh, just a little bit about us uh, for those who don't know. So we are uh, located within the Greenbelt and the Oak Ridges Marine is an environmentally sensitive geological landform here in South Central Ontario. So it stretches 160 kilometers from the Trent River um, in, into the west of the Niagara Escarpment. So it hosts uh, important habitats, including forests and wetlands and um, all these really unique um, landscapes like kettle lakes and, and prairie remnants and uh, other great habitat. So looking at this map, uh, this is the Oak Ridges Brain here, and you can see that it's completely uh, within the green belts. So the green belts is kind of that darker green. And we have kind of approximate locations of our properties. Um, so we keep many locations private to preserve uh, the natural features on our properties. Um, but this kind of gives you an idea of how much of the rain we've reached and where um, some great properties we have are. So why are we protecting the Oak Ridges rain? Um, well, it's this really neat landform. It's scoured off the uh, rocky earth's crust by giant glaciers. So there's these irregular shaped mounds of sand and gravel um, across the Oak Ridges Moraine that absorb water really quickly. Um, and this means that the moraine has an amazing but easily threatened groundwater aquifer system uh, that balances the recharge and discharge of fresh drinking water for over 250,000 people um, and much more uh, in years to come. So it is also a great abundance of species at risk um, that need protection. So how do we protect the moraine? Uh, we contribute to the federal government's goal of protecting 25% of land by 2025 while also connecting people to nature, uh, creating climate change resiliency and protecting green corridors between large natural areas. So with your support, we protect ecologically significant lands on and near the moraine and they're protected forever. Um, we've observed species at risk living on almost every one of our properties, uh, which are made up of 4,480 acres of land. Um, and that's 12 nature reserves, 43 registered conservation easements, three restricted covenants, and two properties in joint ownership. So we support climate change resiliency by protecting ecosystem services like flood control and through maintaining wetlands. And we help connect you with your land. So when you join the Oak Ridges Marine Land Trust community, um, you become part of that we that is really help, helping protect uh, land across the moraine. So as a charity, um, we do not often purchase land. Uh, we do sometimes, but not often. 
So instead, we look for other ways to work with landowners uh, that care deeply about their properties. So anytime we acquire land, it remains under protection forever. Um, and we have, uh, we facilitate the Ecological Gifts Program, which is a really fantastic program uh, that protects lands federally. And it also gives landowners a large tax break for donations on conservation, uh, donations or conservation easement, excuse me. So if you have a property uh, and you worry about what will happen to it to uh, happen to it one day, we facilitate legacy giving that ensures it will remain under our protection and it will never see development. So feel free to contact us if you're interested in all the different ways uh, your land can be protected with us. So we do have some uh, events coming up. We always need volunteers. You can uh, register on our website, okrugismarine.org. Um, and we also have a few webinars coming up in the new year. So uh, check our website and uh, check those events and, and sign up. And we're always happy to um, have you. So without further ado, sorry for the, the long spiel, but uh, here we have Michael Runks. Uh, really excited to, to be listening to him tonight. Um, if you don't know, Michael is one of Canada's most highly respected naturalists and a wonderful nature photographer. Um, he hosts uh, the show Wild by Nature, and he's also authored um, a ton of natural history books. So um, I will stop talking and we'll listen to uh, the smarter man in the room, I guess. Uh, so take it away, Michael. Okay. If you can let me start my video, I will make an appearance here. So far, my video is turned off. Oh, do I have to, I might have to make you a co-host or something. I think so. Try that now. Okay, give that a shot and we'll see. There we are, good. <laughs> Hi everybody. Well, I'm glad to be here. Uh, it was an interesting uh, connection here. We had to uh, do some magic to get on, but I am here now and I'm really happy to be here and to talk about nature. Um, so I'm gonna share my screen now. There we are. And okay, my screen still has the demo on here, but hopefully. Okay. What's going on here now? Um wanted to see my PowerPoint. Hmm. This is very bizarre. My PowerPoint has never there. Finally, okay, maybe now we got all the gremlins out of this presentation. So, yeah. Excellent. Okay, hopefully you can see that. I think we're, we're good to go. Good. Um, yeah, so. Um, this talk is about mostly about local nature and how they deal with the most severe conditions of all, and that is sub-zero temperatures. So we'll see what goes on. First off, I always like starting with a little quote from Ernest Thompson Seaton. Uh, because I've known the torment of thirst, I would dig a well where others may drink. And so I hope you all have a little bit to drink tonight, non-alcohol during this program. Okay, first off, um, there are certain seasons where life's pretty easy for all living things, and uh, and summer certainly is that. But, but of course, summer fades into autumn, and autumn with spectacular colors fades into winter. And with winter comes the most severe challenge of all, and that is sub-zero temperatures, freezing temperatures. So winter looks beautiful. I love winter. But for living organisms out there, it's a really tough season for survival, and many don't make it. The biggest challenge of all uh, lies with getting food in part, because with cold temperatures, invertebrates, which most birds feed on and many other animals feed on, become impossible to find for the most part. And so a lack of food is one major challenge, whether it's a caterpillar on a leaf or flying insects like these midges, birds that depend on these, of course, have a very difficult time finding food. 
Same for sandpipers that probe in mud. Once that mud is frozen, they can't access the invertebrates. So sub-zero does bring, uh, sub-zero temperatures do bring the challenge of finding certain kinds of food. So what do most birds do? They take a trip down south, not really fueled by planes, but by their own fuel. And the vast majority of our birds do leave. Wrong direction for that duck. Uh-oh, terrible accident. And many don't make that trip. So one major solution to sub-zero temperatures, uh, especially for the food aspect, is to fly to southern regions where food is still plentiful. Birds like scarlet tanagers make remarkable journeys. This bird flies from Ontario down to Brazil and may return the following spring. Uh, birds are not the only ones to leave though because of cold conditions. Very few insects do too, including the monarch butterfly, of course, which goes to Mexico. However, many animals do stay, not as many as migrate, but many do stay, especially in terms of birds and, and larger animals, certainly with smaller animals, many do stay in certain forms. But those that stay and face that challenge have a number of adaptations for surviving those temperatures. And by the way, people often show photographs of male uh, Northern Cardinals because they're spectacular. I think the females are equally as beautiful, if not more so, with subtle beauty. Both these birds all face the challenge of sub-zero conditions. So food is one. But probably the major problem that sub-zero temperatures bring to animals is the transformation of water to ice. This, by the way, was photographed, I think, three days ago. Um, all living animals have water inside their systems. And if that water freezes and turns to ice, of course, water expands when frozen, and that can burst body cells. And so for, for animals that, uh, that uh, are up in this region that face these temperatures, they've got to solve the, the freezing condition problem. Larger animals, mammals and birds included, uh, are able to generate their own body heat internally. They have an easier time in some ways, but they still require fuel to generate that heat. If they can't get the fuel, which is food, of course, then they have trouble and they succumb to sub-zero temperatures. It's a huge problem, of course, for animals that are ectothermic. The old days we call them cold-blooded. That only refers to people like O.J. Simpson. Cold-blooded is a poor term for these animals. We'll call them ectothermic, which means they depend on the external temperatures to uh, generate their internal body heat. Yet we have some that survive the winter in the adult stage, and they face these temperatures. Uh, we have butterflies, for example, that we see in early spring. These include the angle wings, the Compton's tortoise shells, the, the commas, and butterflies like that, and of course the morning cloak. And these appear as soon as the snow starts receding from the landscape, because they spent the winter as adult butterflies and they face the sub-zero conditions. So how do they do it? Well, they use antifreeze, glycerol as sort of a universal antifreeze that many ectothermic animals use to keep their body cells from freezing. For example, bumblebees also, but only a few bumblebees really survive the winter. In the fall, when we hit these the temperatures below zero, most bumblebees die, except for the new queens that have mated they survive the winter in burrows underground below the frost line and well, yeah, primarily below the frost line, but they uh, in spring then they lay their eggs, have a generation of workers that they take care of, and then they become just egg laying machines for the rest of the year. But they will die then uh, next fall when they hit temperatures below zero, except for the new queens that have made it. All the males die too, by the way, in the fall. Same for social wasps like yellow jackets. And so these animals have developed a way of surviving, but only a small part of the population does, just enough to carry them on the following season. A few other insects uh, overwinter in the, in the larval stage, a few caterpillars do, like the woolly bear, for example. And again, the antifreeze is their, their trick to survival. One of the more intriguing larval insects you might find in winter lives inside this ball. This ball is on a goldenrod, a special type of goldenrod, and uh, inside that ball is a grub. It's called the goldenrod gall grub, or goldenrod gall fly is what lays the egg initially. The plant swells around it, 
And that little grub lives inside there through summer, feeding on the inside of the gall. And then in winter, it stays inside there using antifreeze to keep it from freezing. Some are known actually to allow better freezing to occur. And we'll talk more about that process and other animals later on. But if you slice that ball open, there's the little grub inside. It already had chewed or chews a tunnel to the outside skin of the gall. And then in spring, when it matures into a fly, it can put its head through that thin skin and escape as a fly and go off and mate and then lay eggs if it's a female fly on other goldenrod stems. Nothing is sacred though in nature. Whenever there is some sort of advantage to be found for an animal, some other kind of animal will exploit that. So there are birds now that will go to a gull, black capped chickadees and downy woodpeckers, and they will excavate those gulls, especially in winter, and eat the wonderful grub inside. So nothing is unexploited when it comes to natural history. Many more insects, by the way, spend the eggs as uh, spend the winter as eggs. And a couple of the great examples: the praying mantid. The female females lay a big mass of eggs in this really unusual structure called the uotheca. And uh, then inside that egg case, there are many, many eggs of the praying mantid that survive the winter in that stage. Walking sticks have a really neat uh, mechanism for surviving winter as eggs. They mate in, at the, toward the end of summer. And you see here how much smaller the female than the male is. Here, sorry, how much larger the female is than the male. And by the way, they have a really kinky mating system. The males have handcuffs that attach to the female here, and they stay attached and copulate for up to three days, just continuous copulation. And, uh, and then when the egg is produced, it looks like this. They look so much like seeds, and in fact, they behave like seeds of certain wildflowers. Many spring wildflowers have their seeds carried underground by carpenter ants, and uh, that's because they have an edible package on them. Well, these uh, eggs of the walking stick also have an edible package on the end and look just like seeds. And ants carry these underground, the eggs underground, where they guard them in a little chamber and eventually eat the edible part leaving the eggs there to hatch. And then next spring, out come the little tiny baby walking sticks out of the colony, climb up trees, especially oak trees, to eat the leaves during the summer. Spectacular. So a lot of our spring flowers and walking sticks uh, need ants for their full life cycle. Going below the frost line is a common strategy for many ectothermic animals. For example, toads, American toads, will burrow down in the soil or go down crevices below the frost line where they go dormant. But they do escape the freezing conditions by going below the depth to which they reach inside the soil. They're great diggers. And they have great attitudes too. Uh, many salamanders also are down below the frost line where they go into a semi-dormant stage like the spotted salamander here. Snakes also must escape freezing conditions, being ectothermic, uh, and uh, they tend to go down into the ground, often in crevices in, in limestone rock especially, but also if they're on the Canadian Shield in an older rock, they go down below, and often in groups. And sometimes those groups contain different species. That's a beautiful red-bellied snake here, a tiny one. Here's some northern water snakes that are gathering in a crevice in the rock. So again, they're, they're doing what's called freeze avoidance. They're using their behavior to get out of the area where frost would cause them damage. Many frogs, but not all as we see, go down to the bottom of waterways uh, and they lie in the bottom. And there they go into a, a semi uh, comatose state where they breathe through their skin. They only have a few breaths per minute and uh, they're lifeless basically, but still can breathe oxygen through their skin. As a mink frog, bullfrogs have that same strategy. But again, down to the bottom, it's about four degrees Celsius in winter. And so they're still safe from that freezing uh, temperature that would turn water to ice. Turtles also, similar behavior. Snapping turtles often go into, say they're in a lake, they go to where a stream comes in. 
There's more oxygen then in the water around them and they too breathe through their skin. Now, snapping turtles, as most turtles, will lay their eggs in late spring. And in the fall then, in October or even late September, when the eggs hatch, the little guys dig their way out and head down to the water and spend the winter then on the bottom of the waterway, out of the reach of the freezing te uh, temperatures. That's for snapping turtles. Here's a hatchling here. There's one exception though. It's unique in the reptile world. These are painted turtles, of course. They have the same process where they lay eggs in late spring, but in the fall when the eggs hatch, sometimes the hatchlings stay in the soil and they are within the, the frost line and they can freeze. And the, over half their body water can turn uh, to ice. In the spring, they thaw out and dig their way out and go to water. It's not all do some hatch in the fall and go to the water, but some stay over winter inside the ground. That's called freeze tolerance, when they can tolerate ice inside their bodies. The ice, though, does not form inside the body cells. They put antifreeze in there, but they control where the ice forms, and that's between the cells. They create special proteins that attract the ice formation around them, and therefore they control where ice occurs. But the strange thing is that hatchling painted turtles that arise from the eggs laid by the female have this ability to be freeze tolerant. But after that first winter in the soil, they lose that ability. Only hatchlings are freeze tolerant. After one year, they are not. And any turtle exposed then to sub-zero temperatures will die. We have a few frogs also that are freeze tolerant. The fabulous four, I call them. Chorus frog, here's a wood frog. Spring peeper, those tiny frogs that can deafen you with their shrill peeps in, in early spring. And one of my favorite animals on this planet, the gray tree frog, that is so well camouflaged on tree trunks, spends much of the time off the ground. Well, in winter, these frogs don't go to ponds or lakes. They actually go in the soil and they stay within the frost line. And they allow then over half their body water to turn ice in the same way the hatchling uh, painted turtle did. And, uh, and they survive. But they do it as adults and they can do it year after year after year until they finally uh, don't make it anymore. Fabulous, fabulous frogs. So ectothermic animals have their challenges. Endothermic have fewer in terms of controlling the, the temperature inside their body, but they still need fuel for that. But they also have to conserve body heat. And they do so by increasing their insulation outside the body. Birds add on more feathers, both under the big contour feathers on the outside of the body. Uh, they have those that grow larger and denser for the winter. Uh, and under those is a layer of down, like underwear for us, thermal underwear in winter, and they grow more down as well. Chickadee insulation is phenomenal. Studies have shown that on a really cold day, if you measure the temperature next to the skin of a chickadee and the temperature outside the feathers, just on the edge of the feathers, you could find up to a 98 degree Fahrenheit difference. That means that the body heat is being trapped next to the body by the feathers and very little is escaping. That's a great, great strategy. Put on extra layers, both externally and next to the skin uh, under the outer feathers. But they also have another trick too. On super cold nights, they can lower their body core temperature by up to 12 degrees Celsius and go into a, a deep sleep called torpor. They're almost lifeless. By lowering their body core temperature, that'll reduce the difference from the body to the air outside. And even though they lose very little body heat, they do lose some, of course. And by lowering that temperature, the gradient is less and it takes less energy then to maintain a lower body temperature than a higher body temperature. And it's a pretty phenomenal thing that other Northern birds do as well on very cold nights. Mammals add on extra layers too. The guard hairs on the outside uh, grow uh, denser and next to the skin is under fur. They're analogous coating to the down of birds. 
And so this extra covering makes them especially attractive uh, for the fur industry. In the early years, of course, they wouldn't trap these animals in summer, but in winter when their coats are at their thickest and finest. But those are there to keep the animals warm, not to keep us warm. Uh, there's a purpose for that. So any winter active animal like this mink has a much denser coat of hair in winter. And that certainly provides not only protection from the outside uh, air temperatures, but also if they're in water, frigid water, for example. Now, one of our, well, several of our local animals do change color. Snowshoe hair is a great example. Snowshoe hairs are also called varying hairs because they vary in their color. They're brown in summer, they go through a change in coat, denser coat for winter. Guard hairs are longer and thicker, and the under fur below is denser. But the outer coat is white. Of course, that offers camouflage. But there's more to white hair than camouflage. Studies have shown that white hair and white feathers on birds, which is why many northern birds are white in, in winter, um, because those uh, either feathers, or in this case hairs, lack pigmentation, they have air spaces in them, which makes them better retaining body heat. Same way double pane windows have air between the panes of glass for trapping house heat. So it's, a study has shown that with snowshoe hairs, not only of course, it does it give them great camouflage, but 26% more energy savings by having white hair in winter than brown hair. So a really important uh, feature for these animals surviving. And if any of you have gone skiing or snowshoeing on trails and scared up a, a snowshoe hare, you know how really well that camouflage works. It's a rather hair raising experience, isn't it? To, to encounter one of these animals. Other mammals develop these thick coats of hair too, but also body fat, something that birds don't do as much. Birds do get more fat under their skin, subcutaneous fat, but they burn that off during cold nights. And uh, with mammals though, they create thick layers of, of, of body fat, white fat under the skin for warmth as well. And also around the organs, they develop a brown fat that has a higher energy output when burnt up internally. But raccoons, for example, develop these things to stay warm, but they're not really that much winter active. They are on warm days, but on cold days they're down inside their den, off at the hollow tree, or if you have a poor, poorly designed garage or attic, they could be inside there. But they go in a dormant stage where it's not true hibernation. It's called lethargy. They slow down their body uh, heart rate and their temperature, but not really quite low as some animals do. That allows them to be easily aroused on warmer days. And raccoons and skunks, for example, and porcupines are certainly more active on quite warm days in winter. Porcupines are active much of the winter, but still in super cold sessions, they will go into a lethargic state to save energy. And their dens are often in rock crevices, hollow trees also. And you can always tell when a, a site has been used for many, many years by the amount of droppings at the entrance. At a hollow tree, be at the base or under a rock pile like this and a little escarpment, you will see these huge piles of droppings showing the porcupines have been there for many, many winters. And like certainly tracks in the snow leading out are a common sight, especially on warmer days in winter. Then we come into the category some people call hibernation. I think you've all heard at some point that bears hibernate. Well, I disagree with that. And here's why. Black bears do spend the winter in endurance. Their dens are not spectacular. In fact, here's a winter bear den right here. Here's an old birch broken off tree. The tree had fallen down. The bear was lying under the fallen tree, sound asleep. I know that because there was a radio transmitter on it. And I was with the researcher who was tracking these sleeping bears. Um, so they're in these dens, but their heart rate goes down to eight beats per minute. So they're barely breathing. But the body temperature stays near summer, summer levels. And that allows bears to get easily awoken and uh, awake during this period, which is important for females, especially because they give birth in January to the little, little offspring. Here's another bear den, an overturned uh, series of cedar trees with the roots up in the air in a cedar swamp. 
uh, I was brought here by a person who found the den. He, his dog had led him there and he saw a very small bear. So he brought me there a few days later and I snowshoed in with him. And lo and behold, it wasn't just a little bear. It was mother bear and two cubs, both in their second winter. They spend the first winter with her, of course, because they're born, but they come back the next winter with her and uh, over winter as well. And when this big female put her head up, the fellow who took me there said, that, 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 that's not the bear I saw a few days ago. <laughs> Easily awoken indeed. And again, the cubs stay with the mother for the full summer then and spend the next winter with her as well. Yeah. By the way, in preparation for winter uh, dormancy, um, bears eat a lot of fat producing foods in the end of summer. They go for a lot of invertebrates, often under rocks like this. They'll climb trees for certain uh, uh, crops of things like acorns and cherries and beech nuts. They love beech nuts. These are uh, uh, seeds full of fat. And that's easy converted to body fat. And so they climb these trees. They can forage on the ground. But of course, uh, in late summer, early fall, there's a lot of beech nuts up high in the tree. And they climb the trees. And, and they are superb climbers. If you go to an older beech tree in bear country, you will inevitably find their claw marks uh, scarred over from being there for a few years. Fresh uh, claw marks are orange. The tree's just freshly scarred, but they eventually scar over and turn black. And they have great feet for climbing trees. These rough pads, and by the way, a prize photograph. This is not a captive bear. This is a, a wild bear. I wanted a foot shot. But these fantastic pads, rough pads, almost like sandpaper on the bottom for grip. And look at those claws for digging in the trunk. Of course, these claws are also used for helping capture prey like deer, fawns, or moose calves. So I guess for those animals, these would be uh, certainly claws for concern, I would say, if you're one of those little animals. Now, the bears climb the trees as high as they can. They can't climb on a small branch, it would break. So they sit up where they can, where it's safe. They reach out and break off branches to access the acorns or the nuts on the tree, in the case of the beech tree. When they leave after foraging there day after day, there's a huge tangle of broken limbs. And when you see the leaves off the trees in the fall, you see sites like this. These are not giant bird's nests, but they look like bird nests, and therefore they're called bear nests. When they go to cherry trees, bigger cherry trees will have bear nests in them. But smaller trees like this, especially after a big bear has made a visit, certainly show, show the signs of being visited by that heavy animal. That's a, a, a choke cherry from this fall. Of course, bears also eat fruit on the ground. And if blueberries are in a, in, a, in a big crop, they certainly spend a lot of time foraging on blueberries. And it's amazing to me that they use their tongues and their lips to extract the berries from the plants and they don't devour the whole plant. You don't find twigs and leaves of blueberries and bear droppings, just the uh, seeds that have passed through. So I spent a lot of time like this. I spent a lot of time trying to photograph bears. It's kind of hard because they're pretty shy animals normally. And if they sense something coming like a human and you're crouched down low, even being pretty motionless, they will stand up for a better view than run away at the slightest hint that you are uh, not a, a inanimate ob object. The end result of the uh, eating those berries is to have beautiful droppings with the seeds inside. The plants have exploited the bears, by the way, to disperse their seeds for them, offering them a sweet offering of fruit. And in return, the bears are transporting the seeds. And I love, this is feeding on not blueberries in this case, but raspberries and probably elderberries. And uh, not only are the seeds there, but the beautiful color is there. Really reminds me of one of those Dairy Queen raspberry sundays with the, you know, the beautiful swirls and the seeds in there, raspberries, beautiful indeed. So I would not call bears true hibernators because they have this very high body temperature near summer levels, but low heart rate. Chipmunks by some people uh, are termed to be hibernators, but they're not true hibernators either. If you define hibernation as being dormant for the entire winter, chipmunks store food underground. They spend a lot of time harvesting things like choke cherries. 
and uh, other fruits and nuts. They love acorns. And they have these incredible carrying bags in their mouth. Their, their cheeks can expand dramatically and they can put in acorns. But what they do sometimes is they'll chew off the husk of the acorn to access the seed inside so they can pack more in their mouth at one time. And their cheeks really can bulge. They're, they're saving energy by making one trip with a number of seeds instead of a number of trips for the same number of seeds. Now, what is a hibernator then? Oh, by the way, with the chipmunks go back here, they're underground in their chambers. They awaken every few days and go to their storage pile and eat. They have another room for, for their bathroom uh, uh, activities, then back to their sleeping chamber again. So they awaken every few days all through the winter and eat. So that to me is not true hibernation. What is a true hibern hibernator then? Well, how about this animal here, the groundhog? In fact, by many uh, authors' accounts, the groundhog is the world's largest hibernating animal, the largest. And uh, they really fatten up for winter. They go underground below the frost line. They curl into a ball to uh, reduce their surface area to volume ratio, so less heat is lost into the environment around them. And they sleep for most of the winter. They still would awaken occasionally, and, and like a thermostat going off to make sure they don't uh, they don't uh, run the risk of freezing to death if the temperatures do drop down to their level, which they don't, but they awaken, change the position, and then go back to sleep again. So these are true hibernators. We only have two other mammals around here that also are true hibernators, and those are the jumping mice. Both woodland and meadow jumping mice uh, go on the ground, curl into a ball, and stay there for the entire winter as well in a very dormant stage where both the body temperature and the heart rate drop right down near zero. So they are barely living through the entire winter, except for those episodes where the heart speeds up a little bit and, and then they go back to sleep again. So these animals that go dormant in any form, whether it's lethargy, like the porky, porky, well, the more the raccoons and skunks, or uh, chipmunks underground and so on, uh, don't have to worry about finding food in the winter. But some animals do find food and therefore stay active all the time in sub-zero conditions. Woodpeckers, for example, can access invertebrates in the wood of trees under the bark. Other birds can feed on fruit if it's available like starlings. And certainly we have birds that are fruit dedicated birds in winter, like our wax wings, both cedar and bohemian that travel from the Northwest down to here in large numbers some years. These are fruit specialists. They travel around to find fruit. They have very large openings to the beak. The gape is very large for swallowing fruit whole and short intestines internally for processing fruit quickly because they get some nutrition from fruit, but they must eat a lot of fruit to get their daily requirement. And they'll toss berries like this buckthorn berry in the air to swallow it. They're really amazing to watch. And they can poop out a seed in uh, less than 20 minutes. I think about 12 minutes for some wax wings, which is pretty remarkable. There's fruit available for some birds, but there are more seeds for other birds. And we have a lot of seed eating birds here that spend the winter because their food is fairly plentiful. Things like the finches, including common red poles and certain sparrows. These are common red poles here. And amongst them, if you're lucky, you'll find a hoary red pole, a more Northern species that also feeds on seeds in winter. I mentioned sparrows, American tree sparrows are seed specialists. And if song sparrows of winter, they also devour the seeds as well. So another whole set of, uh, of food for animals that can eat seeds. One of the most specialized seed eating animals we have are, is the crossbill. We have two species here, the white winged crossbill, which has a smaller bill usually than red crossbill, the other species. And often they extract the seeds from the cones of spruces. Red crossbills, Usually it go to larger trees like pine trees, but there are smaller build subspecies that will travel east sometimes and they can extract seeds from spruce cones just like white winged crossbills can. They're called crossbills because their bills cross over the tips and they put these tips under the scales of the cone 
The seeds are hidden under the scales or the back of the scale. The birds use their bills, bills laterally, prying open the scales. Their tongue goes in and extracts a seed. Superb bill for getting seeds out of conifers. Not so good for getting grit off the ground though, because seed eating birds often add little bits of grit to their gizzard to help grind up those hard seeds. How do crossbills do it? They do it like this. They've got to use their tongue to pick up those bits of grit, not their actual bill, like a finch would do, a other finch would do, sorry, or a sparrow might do. So there are seeds and berries, and of course there are small mammals available for those birds and other animals that, that can devour them. So we have another whole regime of food that fuels the appetites of owls. That was a uh, northern hawk owl at the start. Great gray owls also with their incredible facial discs for hearing sounds underground, pinpointing audibly, and then pouncing on whatever is there. I had to show this from yesterday. <laughs> I photographed a, a hawk owl in Algonquin Park, and I just love these birds. Unlike most owls, these are fully diurnal, and they have more pointed wings like a falcon for faster speed. And uh, this one has been around for a while, but uh, what a beautiful bird. And when we fly, you can see the wings are more pointed. Most owls have rounded wings for solid flight, but hawk owls have pointed wings for speed, like a falcon almost. Not quite as fast, but pretty darn fast still. Another predatory bird we have here in winter only is a northern shrike. We have loggerheads in a few spots. They're an endangered species in summer, but in winter, the northern comes down from the upper boreal forest, actually up in the Hudson Bay lowland, actually. Very northern birds. And these are neat birds because they are raptorial. They have a raptorial bill. They kill with their bill, but they have songbird feet, or so songbird feet, so they haven't got the big talons of a hawk or an owl, and they tend to impale their food before they eat it. And it can be a hawthorn, for example, or a broken off branch, or even barbed wire in some cases. And if food is plentiful, they will store extra ones on this. They'll skewer them, uh, just like uh, uh, whatever you call these things, you skewer things on, but they're skewered. And one of my favorite, this is a, uh, a metal vole here. One of my favorite sites I've seen was this shrew that was clearly impaled on a uh, hawthorn by a northern shrike. They create a larder to be enjoyed at a later date. They only store food when food is plentiful and is extra, but other animals in preparation for those sub-zero temperatures store food all through the fall in preparation for water. Animals like gray squirrels, for example, they will harvest seeds of things like uh, mantle of maples. They will harvest uh, nuts of trees uh, that bear nuts, and they will uh, bury them in the ground for the winter. They love acorns. And if you ever see, by the way, branches nipped off lying on the ground, it's done by squirrels trying to access the, the in this case, acorns out on a, a little thin branch they can't walk on. So they nip it off, go to the ground, and get them down there. This is a lovely uh, oak here. And uh, then they bury them one at a time and go back in the winter and dig them up. So their strategy is to scatter hoard. They hide hundreds and hundreds of nuts and other things all through their territory and then retrieve them in the winter time. So they scatter hoard. And a sure sign of this is when you see a nut like this dug up and, and enjoyed by them. That's one of the hickories. By the way, the, the gray squirrel we have comes in dark gray, charcoal gray, but also comes in a lighter brown color as well. And you see different variations on, don't you? You see the rare blonde phase that not only is more rare to see, but also for the squirrel bearing that coat is a lot more fun as well, apparently, the blonde phase. And you see mixed appearances now too. Fashionable. Now, I had to show this. This is the oddest squirrel I've ever seen. It was swimming across a November creek in front of my canoe and climbed on shore. And I thought, what have I seen? This is, is this from Lord of the Rings? Um, what it is, is an albino gray squirrel that's got mange. And without that thick coat of hair that the normal squirrel would have, uh, white hair could be an advantage for surviving sub-zero temperatures. But lack of hair, that squirrel wouldn't live much longer after I saw it because cold temperatures did set in soon after. 
Now, in terms of staying warm, uh, some animals exploit the snow. And they exploit the snow for not only for staying warm, but also for storing food. In the case of the red squirrel, um, they spend a lot of time under the snow where it's warmer. And they have different tunnels going through. And they also have areas where they store their cones to enjoy those uh, uh, seeds of the conifers in winter. Whenever you see a hole in the snow and a big pile of scales that have been bitten off from a cone, that's caused by a red squirrel. They tend to make larger hordes compared to the gray squirrel, not those signal scatter hoarding. They'll have several areas in their territory though, the big pile of cones, sometimes dozens, sometimes even more. If you go west to the Rockies, they will score, they will store hundreds, maybe even thousands of cones in a big central storage pile. So some animals store uh, small stores scattered everywhere, others store you know, larger clumps. Some birds do this too. And my favorite bird for food storage is this one right here. This was formerly called the gray jay. Now it's called the Canada jay, more appropriately. And why is that? Because this bird is very patriotic. That's why we call it Canada jay. Right. Um, these are neat birds because they store food through the late summer and fall for the winter. They nest early to get off the nest and be able to store food at that time. They start nesting at the end of February. They line their nest with soft material, Here's some cattail down this one was carrying. They're on eggs by early March, even earlier in some years. And they are boreal forest birds, so they're in really cold conditions. And uh, then when the eggs hatch, they feed the young, of course, stored food as well. And uh, by the middle of May, they're ready to fledge. Just when the other songbirds are returning to the boreal forest to nest, they are done for the year. And they start storing food. The food could be seeds, it could be mushroom pieces, it could be bits of flesh, it could be caterpillars. They have a very diverse diet. They wrap the food in saliva inside their enlarged mouths and enlarged salivary glands. And they stash that and sticks it under lichens and under loose spark, especially on spruce trees. Then they go back with their incredible spatial memory. They are storing single items in thousands of locations in their territory, thousands, and know where everyone is and go there and retrieve that stored food and utilize it. And I was lucky last winter, I was able to get a photograph that shows clearly it was eating stored food. This Canada jay began to yawn and yawn, and out of its mouth came leftovers from a stored meal. And what are these leftovers? This is in February. Those were choke cherry pits, showing clearly the bird had stored choke cherries in August, end of August, and retrieved them in February, and they were still quite edible then. Remarkable birds. They do scatter hoarding to a great extent. Other animals do a big central cache of food. And the best example of that is the beaver. So here's a beaver lodge. And here in front is a pile of branches that you only really see with leaves on like this at the end of summer and the end of the fall. They spend a lot of time out of the water then, uh, cutting down materials, drawing them back to the water. They have defined trails called drag trails, not because they change their appearance, but because they are dragging material down to the water or they drag it across to the lodge and food pile as it's called. They'll bring some materials like this that are not to be eaten, but to be put on top of the food pile to keep the good stuff below where the water is not frozen in winter. So the top of the food pile is ballast and you can't judge a book by its cover, nor can you uh, judge a food pile by its cover. You have to go down underneath because the good stuff they love, like uh, uh, chumming aspen, for example, is taken, they dive down with it and put it at the bottom of the food pile. And then finally, you know, the pile grows larger and larger and larger. And then they still continue right until full freeze up. And in fact, what beavers do is they maintain a channel open to the shore and a channel around the food pile to keep adding materials until the ice gets too thick. So beavers break the ice. And I know you're wondering, how do beavers break the ice? Maybe a few little cocktails and little sandwiches. <laughs> no, they don't break the ice that way. They use the back of their heads. They come up to the ice 
And they do this early in the morning, usually, after it freezes overnight. And they keep doing this until the ice gets too thick to break. But until then, you'll see sites like this at a beaver lodge at daybreak when they're out there trying to get the channels open to continue storing food for the winter. And then when the ice finally gets too thick to break, they are settled into their lodge and they dive through one of the tunnels under the water, under the ice to get a branch and bring it back inside again to enjoy during those long cold winter uh, months. Now, just think about beavers. They're swimming in that water, four degrees Celsius under the ice. They can be standing on top of the ice and look at their tails. Two thirds of the tail is not fur. It's just a thin layer uh, of, uh, of fat and muscle and, uh, and uh, no hair on top, it's got scales. And their feet are large and they're swimming in frigid waters. How do they not freeze their feet or their tails? Well, they've got a special system that many winter active animals have that have exposed extremities. They have at the base of their tail here, a counter current heat exchanger. The arteries that come down to the tail and the veins that come down here meet and they branch out in this part of the body and form a net. That net is not used in summertime, but in winter the net is activated and the warm arterial blood is going through small vessels wrapped around the, the veins and the heat's transferred to the cold blood in the veins going back to the heart and lungs. So by the time the blood gets down to the tail, it's down to only a couple of degrees above freezing while the blood going back to the heart is pre-warmed. That saves energy at that end, but also what it does at the extremities, like the feet, they have the base of the legs also, this heat exchanger, and the tail, um, because the temperature of those extremities is only a couple of degrees above freezing, there's less heat loss to the environment. And in fact, in four degrees water, if your tail is two degrees, you actually gain a benefit from that. This wonderful system is called a wonderful net. A ret mirabile is the scientific name for it. It's at, it's at the base of tails and legs of beavers, other animals. There's a muskrat has it as well. Aren't they adorable little rodents? Look at the size of those feet for swimming. And notice how the, the toes are pink at the end, less blood flowing down there. And so this wonderful tool of the beaver is a heat uh, uh, exchanger in, in the wall well, appears. Here's, here's a basal third of the tail that's all muscle and hair heavily. So here's the full length of tail right here. But here's what the heat, the heat exchanger is right up here. Ducks also think about their feet, no feathers on their feet, yet standing on ice and swimming in, in frigid water. Same thing at the base of their leg is this wonderful net. Here's a little diagram of it showing how the arteries and veins branch around each other here. They can be bypassed in summer and then activated in winter. And by the time the blood runs down here in the arteries, it's down to look how, look how cool it is here, you know, done. So the blood going back to the heart is warmed and the blood coming down to the foot is cooled down. And again, to only a couple of degrees above freezing usually. Now, other winter active animals, which are smaller, have another means of staying warm. They will use the snow as a blanket of warmth. You've heard of blanket of snow, well, they use it. And what they'll do is they'll burrow down through that snow, down, 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 next to the ground. And there next to the ground under the snowpack is a little layer, special layer, highly crystallized. And they can move through there really readily. And that layer down there, which is called the subnivian space, is only a few degrees if that below zero. It can be minus one down there. And on warmer days, maybe even zero degrees, because latent heat from the earth is being trapped by the snow and melting it a little bit and forming these crystals down here. And a lot of small mammals are active through the winter in this subnivian space where it's much warmer. Plus, they find food there too, of course, seeds on the ground and so on. Red squirrels are about the biggest animal that can get down there and exploit this subnivian space too. When the snow melts in, in spring, by the way, you often find the trails down there, various small mammals are pushing their way through before the snow melted. Some animals use under the snow for warmth, while a few use the actual snow itself. On really cold nights, rough grouse will dive into the snow Here's where one dove in, make a little bed under the snow, sorry, go back, make a little bed under the snow where it stays warm 
And the next morning it comes up, breaks through and flies away. If you find a hole like this, but no exit hole somewhere else, you know, the grouse is down there and you can go over to it. And if you're lucky, the grouse will pop up before it takes off. And then later it'll dive back down somewhere else and create a new snow bed. Here's where it took off from right here. Rough grouse have another trick. I uh, shouldn't see up their sleeve, but maybe on their toes. Sub-zero temperatures bring snow. Snow provides warmth for some animals, but it also provides a mobility problem for others. It's hard to get through it. So what do rough grouse do? They actually get snowshoes for the winter, but not this kind of snowshoe. Theirs is a natural snowshoe that grows on their toes in the autumn. They grow scales out from each side of the toe these enlarge the surface area and give them a chance to walk on top of the snow, which they do with great ease. Uh, larger mammals can't grow scales on their toes, but what they can do is have very large hind feet act as snowshoes. Here's a Martin's hind foot, really large compared to the front foot. Same for a fisher. How about snowshoe hares? You know, snowshoe hair tells you what their foot's about. The hind foot is massive compared to the front foot right here. So a big surface area. So they can, they can leap away, of course, with great speed in summer, but in winter they can travel on top of the snow. And as you can see here, this appears to give the impression that the front feet are huge, but of course they leapfrog as they jump so the hind feet go in front of the front feet, creating this distinctive pattern of tracks. Moose don't have snowshoes. They have hooves that do spread somewhat, but their advantage comes from having really long legs, about two meters high at the shoulder. And they have a special movement in their hips and, and the legs. So they can actually do things we can't do uh, to get their foot feet uh, lifted up out of the snow onto the next spot. And so they can go through deep snow with relative ease because the way their legs are, are long, but also the way the joints are expressed in those legs. They are remarkable. I had to throw these, these from yesterday, I had a pretty good day yesterday, hawk owl and then uh, some bull moose. And uh, the antlers that are used for displaying the females during the fall mating season are just excess baggage. And so journey by the end of December, by the end of this month or early January at the latest, the big bulls will, the bulls will drop their antlers and grow new ones the following year. It also allows them to show their change in stature uh, to a female as well. But just a couple of pictures. They're eating snow. Uh, some animals get their water in winter by eating snow. One of their favorite foods in winter is balsam fir. And that goes for much of Ontario. And so they spend a lot of time by the way, bulls lose about 10% of their body weight during the rut. They walk around for weeks trying to get uh, access to females and don't eat during that time. When the rut's all over, they are terribly hungry and they spend as much time as possible browsing. And the, by the way, the bulls often travel in groups. There are three bulls together here, three bulls and nice bulls. And uh, what they would do is, and now and again, they get together and touch antlers and do a little bit of what's called sparring to establish dominance. Then they would stop and eat side by side. And I've seen this over the years where often in late November, early December, bulls form little groups and do a lot of this shoving back and forth. And I suspect as to learn who's who in the moose world. So next year when the game is for real and they're competing for mates, they can tell who's who. And if one bull has bigger antlers and was stronger the previous year, that gives them a chance to back away and avoid any kind of, of damage or injury incurred by these great antlers they sport. Lots of animals uh, have trouble with snow. This animal here has much less so than many. That's an otter, these are river otters. And they have a neat body plan. Uh, of course, they're experts in swimming in the water, but get them in deep snow, you, you might think they have trouble. But they got a way around this. They can travel on ice, certainly under the ice very readily, but on top of the ice, they use their body plan to best advantage. They have short little legs, which are really good for power swimming, but the long body is uh, an aid for getting around on top of frozen ground. And what they do is they run and they slide on their bellies like a toboggan. They toboggan, not only on ice, as this one here is doing, 
Uh, and here, uh, this, is, this is from three days ago. Here's a beaver dam here. And you can see where the otters have come up. And look at all these wonderful trails where they're sliding, sliding. There are five different otter prints, one, two, three, four, five, that came up. So a whole family group moving through this uh, area. They also travel on snow the same way too, where they run and slide on their bellies. What a great way of conserving energy and using your body plan to best advantage. So sub-zero temperatures that arrive with winter um, do pose challenges for all living things. But as we have seen and as standard for nature, whenever there's a challenge, whenever there's a problem, there's not only one solution to it, but multiple solutions. And we certainly see that in this most trying time of year with sub-zero temperatures, when many animals do not survive uh, to the following spring, that nature has responded beautifully with not just one solution to getting food or to staying warm or being, uh, ha having mobility, but with a great diversity. And that makes looking at nature, even in winter, one of the most exciting pastimes because every animal you don't encounter, but that is there, or that you do encounter, has some special means or many special means of surviving both the problems of lack of food and staying not frozen, staying unfrozen in the challenge that winter brings. So all these wonderful members of our natural community have much to tell us about how we should survive sub-zero conditions. Thank you very much. And, and um, please support the Oak Ridges Marine Land Trust and, and any other land trust as well in your area because we need these groups so desperately to help preserve what little we have left and we're losing more and more on a daily basis. So hats off to the Oak Ridges Marine Land Trust and, uh, and to you for supporting them as well. Thanks very much. Oh, thank you so much, Michael. That was incredible. Uh, so many great photos and uh, lots of great info for, um, for me to think about. So uh, thank you so much. Got lots of thank yous in the chat. Uh, we did have two questions pop up. Um, so I'll just uh, verbal those to you if that's all right, Michael. Absolutely, I'll stop sharing my screen now too, I guess. And Great, so um, Heather Cooper has asked, um, people are instructed everywhere not to feed wildlife for a number of valid reasons. I don't hear this discussion about backyard bird feeders. Should they be an exception? If so, oh, why? That's an excellent question. Then there's a, you know, a real, uh, um, not debate over that, but overall it's been shown that feeding birds at bird feeders does not really have a, a negative effect on them. Um, some people think that if you feed birds in the winter, you're making birds stay behind, you're changing migration patterns, you are not. And for those that feed, for example, Niger seed to finches, and especially goldfinches, you will realize that some years those feeders sit filled all winter long, no goldfinches. Next year, you might have dozens coming to them. And that's because these birds that are partly migratory will stay behind if natural foods are available. For example, seeds on birch trees. If there's a big crop, they'll stay behind in larger numbers. Um, and so we're not really having a negative effect on them. What you are doing in a few rare cases, if a bird lingers behind, it would normally die because it wouldn't find food. It may sustain them. And so therefore you might have a, a, a bird that's fairly rare in winter, like a brown thrasher in you know, the auto region, for example, uh, staying behind. Um, so the important thing is if you are feeding birds, it's, it's important to keep your feeders clean. That's the biggest problem is that dirty feeders can start transmitting diseases to birds and, uh, and dirty, feeder, dirty bird feeders are the principal source of this. Um, so really in terms of feeding birds, uh, it is not affecting them. Uh, and I think it's very different than say feeding a wolf, for example, or, or habituating a, a wild animal like that, that normally is very much afraid of people, feeding coyotes, feeding wolves, uh, feeding foxes and so on. To me, that's a very different thing than feeding birds at bird feeders. That's a great answer. And uh, any quick tips on cleaning bird feeders? 
Yeah, well, um, take, bring them in, take them apart, use uh, hot water and maybe a little bit of detergent or a slight bit of bleach. But uh, the thing about bird feeders, they tend to have more problems uh, if seeds in for a long period of time and the seeds get wet. So if you think you're, you know, you've had, say, like a case where snow is melting at the bottom of the feeder and the lower seeds are absorbing that moisture, make sure you take it apart, clean everything out and dry it thoroughly. Um, and just do it on a regular basis. It, uh, you don't have to do it every couple of days, but I certainly would think about doing it every couple of weeks. Okay, that's great to know. Um, we have one more question here um, from an anonymous attendee. Uh, buckthorn is invasive. Should we keep some around to feed the birds or will they find other uh, alternatives well, if we get rid of the buckthorn? On our that's farm? a great question. Now, the different types of buckthorn, there's common buckthorn and there's glossy buckthorn. Glossy buckthorn tends to invade, uh, be invasive in wetter areas. While common buckthorn is more of a open edge, you know, field edge, hedgerow type of plant. And, and I don't think common buckthorn is considered to be a real problem tree where glossy buckthorn is because glossy buckthorn will crowd out native species in wetlands and, and, uh, and is a very serious thing. Um, common buckthorn provides a lot of food in uh, fall, late fall and winter for birds. And uh, I think by many accounts, it's not considered to be the real problem that glossy buckthorn is. So, um, that that's my answer is that there are different types of buckthorn and two non-native and uh, one is i think more of a problem than the other one is hmm. okay that gives me a little bit of hope considering how much uh common buckthorn is around so yeah i i, I like birds in winter going to buckthorn so i'm kind of selfish that way and and you know <laughs> not being finding it offensive yeah it's it's food nonetheless i guess so. Uh, okay, so wonderful. Thank you so much again, Michael. Um, really great presentation, incredible photos. Um, and thank you everyone for, for attending. We had a really great turnout tonight. Um, like I mentioned earlier, we did record the session, so we will be uh, posting that on our YouTube um, and it'll be available on our website as well if um, you'd like to revisit some of those great points and great photos. So. Um, thank you all again. Thank you, Michael. And um, my yeah. pleasure. Okay. Have a good night, all. Bye now. Thanks. Recording will only be posted for two weeks. So um, we'll send out an email and, and hop on that uh, if you do want to watch it um, and, and catch up. It's a limited time offer. So. <laughs> All right, I think I'm gonna Good. End, end this up and uh, thanks, Michael. Well, thank you, Jim. Thanks, uh, thanks again for all the help I had to start. That was quite an interesting start. Yeah, <laughs> not, not the best way you wanna start, but if, hey, no, we start. got going on time. So yeah, good. it was okay. uh, really well done, thanks. All right, good. Talk again, bye yep. for now. Bye now. <laughs>